end of all things is at hand. Therefore, be sober-minded and self-controlled for the sake of your prayers. Above all, keep loving one another earnestly, since love covers a multitude of sins. Show hospitality to one another without grumbling. As each has received a gift, use it to serve one another as good stewards of God's very grace. Whoever speaks as one who speaks the oracles of God, whoever serves as one who serves by the strength that God supplies, in order that in everything God may be glorified through Jesus Christ, to him belong glory and dominion forever and ever. Amen. Before we dive into the text, we will be looking at each verse, you know, one by one, but I want to talk about the big picture of why Peter is writing, what he's writing in this section, and, and the reason that we are even paying attention to this, the reason that we're following it. Jesus was one of, uh, Peter was one of Jesus' disciples for three years at least, and he, he had his ups and downs, but he had a high view of God. And I, I took the time to list out a few verses that talk about the truths of who Jesus is, because it's, it's for Jesus that we live out these truths that are written in this text. We love one another. We pray as if the, the end of all things is at hand. We show hospitality to one another and we serve one another because of Jesus, because of who Jesus is. Peter knew who Jesus was. So this, this list that he gives us, this, this exhortation that he gives to believers is not, is not a list of things to do to be a Christian or to become a believer, but it's a response to those who are believers. And believers in what? In Jesus. So I took a few, I took a few verses, and I'll read them out loud, and I will, I will cite where they're from, but don't feel like you need to turn to that page. I, I have a few of them, just try and listen and think about these truths. Talking about Jesus, this verse says, to all, to all who did receive him, who believed in his name, he gave them the right to become children of God, who were born not of blood, nor of the will of the flesh, nor of the will of man, but of God. And that's John 1.12. next verse you guys might know for, for God so loved the world that he gave his only son that whoever believes in him shall not perish but have eternal life for God did not send his son into the world to condemn the world but in order that the world might be saved through him and that's John three sixteen and 17 and then Jesus, in this next passage, he, he has this moment where he kind of recalls to mind that, that moment where Moses is talking to God in the burning bush in the, in the wilderness. If you have that mo moment in mind, Jesus is talking to the, to the Jews at the time who are questioning about him about who he is and saying, what do you know about our father Abraham? Jesus said to them, Truly, truly, I say to you, before Abraham was, I am. It's John 8, 58. Then in Ephesians, about Jesus, it says, In him we have redemption through his blood, the forgiveness of our trespasses, according to the riches of his grace. Ephesians 1 7. And then one more that I have here Romans 10 9. If you confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord 
and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. <coughs> Just thinking about these truths is so amazing to think about and picture who Jesus is and who what Jesus has done for us. It's with these truths and many more like them that Peter is writing these letters uh, to the Christians. He He is not, like I said, he's not giving us a list of things to do, but he's writing out what an appropriate response looks like for those who trust in Jesus, who believe in Jesus, and who understand who God is. So as we're looking at this text, just think more on who Jesus is. It's for him that we look at these texts. It's for him that we make changes in our lives. With that, we'll start in verse 7. The end of all things is at hand. Therefore, be self-controlled and sober-minded for the sake of your prayers. When I was in high school, we <coughs> crossed country for a couple of years. I ran a, a six-minute mile for three miles. That was our, our regular race, was a three-mile race. And I kept up that pace pretty well. My fastest time was like 17.59. And uh, I was pretty happy about that. But I remember every single race I had, no matter how fast I ran the particular race for the most of the expanse, when I was on that home stretch, when I was at the end and I could see the finish line, for that last eighth of a mile, I kicked it into high gear. It was no longer a six-minute mile. It was more like a three-and-a-half-minute mile. I was on a full-blown sprint going full steam ahead. If my arms fell off, I'd keep going. If my legs fell off, I'd roll through the finish line because I was going so fast. I, I didn't have enough time to look over my shoulder, either shoulder, to see who was behind me or who was next to me. All that just dropped aside, and I had my eyes set straight ahead because the end was at hand. And I, I didn't care about the rest of the race. I didn't care about thinking past that because the end was right there. I was in the home stretch. I could see the finish line. And likewise, here, the end of all things is at hand. And whether you're, there's debate whether that means that we're living in the end times or that Jesus Christ is going to come at any moment and we don't know when that's going to be. Either way, the response is the same. If you're in the end or the end is right there, you full focus ahead. And that's, that's the idea that he, ha he has in mind. And for that reason, we're to remain self-controlled and sober-minded. And these two words that Peter uses are pretty synonymous. As I've looked at the text, as I've looked at what he means by sober-minded, it doesn't, as I've come to it, it doesn't necessarily mean talking about drunkenness or or drug abuse, but both of these terms he uses as a, a state of mind type of, of reference. When you're, when you're in the home stretch, nothing else matters. Everything is set straight ahead. You don't worry about the things to your left or to your right. You have an eternal mindset in Peter's perspective right here. I actually uh, got a definition from my college dictionary um, sober-minded. It says, devoid of frivolity, excess or exaggeration, <coughs> or speculative imagination. Straightforward. Which I truly believe is the kind of meaning that Peter has when he says remain sober-minded. He goes on from there, maintain this eternal mindset for the sake of your prayers. I, I see it elsewhere in scripture as well that if being sober-minded and self-controlled is for, you maintain those things for the sake of your prayers, that is hint that prayers can be hindered. If we are not self-controlled, if we are not sober-minded, if we're not setting our gaze upon the heavenly things, upon eternal things, Prayers can be hindered. And we see that earlier on in 
in the chapter in, in the book of Peter in uh, chapter three when he talks to the husbands. He says, "Husbands, live with your wives in an understanding way." It's for the sake of your prayers. Later on in another book in James, at the end of James, he's talking about prayer. And he says how the prayer of a righteous man avails much. And so there is much to be said about maintaining a right standing, maintaining a clear-minded focus on Christ for the sake of your prayers. Because we're in this home stretch. We're in this short time. This, this, however many years you have on earth, be it 60 or 80 or 120 in my case, uh, <laughs> you know, it's, it's short. <coughs> it's very short in comparison to eternity. It's just a vapor of smoke that is passing away. And with that in mind, we keep Christ at the center of our lives. Verse 8, above all, keep loving one another earnestly. Since love covers a multitude of sins. Above all, love one another. In in First John, he says, For this is the message that you have heard from the beginning, that we should love one another. This is no new concept. To love one another is a message we've heard since the beginning of time. Since the beginning of man and woman. And, and there is no... We are not to praise or exalt when, when somebody is hurt or slandered, but we are to uplift one another and love one another. And when Jesus came, he was all about teaching people to love. And, and I don't think you can find anybody, Christian or non-Christian, who would tell you otherwise. And, and again, in, in 1 John 3.16, he says, by this we know love, that he laid down his life for us, and we ought to lay down our lives for the brothers. I mean, it's a, it's a perfect picture. Remember who Jesus is. Remember what Jesus has done for us. His example was set for us. He laid down his life for us. And what a great way to show our brothers and our sisters our, our love for them is to follow that example and lay down my rights, lay down the things that I desire and the things that I consider my life for the sake of my brother or my sister. I'm called to that love. And I'm not, I'm not forced to. I don't, I don't have to. But Christ gave that to me. And I want to return that. Uh, and love covers a multitude of sins. That's a verse that's confused me a number of times. I've always thought, like, okay, what does that mean? If I, <coughs> if I come over and I kick Adam, and I come over and I hug Jared, is that okay? Because the love that I'm showing Jared covers the sin that I, that I did towards my brother Adam over there. And I, I, don't, I don't see that in Scripture. I don't think that's what it's saying. I, in fact, he's echoing a, a proverb in Proverbs 10.9. Uh, uh, and, and this talk about love covering a multitude of sin, it's not, it's not blanketing uh, wrong sins done. Love doesn't erase away the bad that you've done. Rather, love keeps you above the line of sin. If you are loving one another, you're not going to have the time to turn your back and, and to, to sin against someone. If you're spending your time loving them. So in that sense, love is covering a multitude of sins. It's keeping you above reproach. Where are we at? Verse 9. Show hospitality to each other without grumbling. I think this is a, an easy enough to understand concept, but very important nonetheless. Grumbling, grumbling really takes the focus off of love. And grumbling puts all that focus on yourself. It, it turns a good deed into a bad deed when I think about all the ways that 
I'm wrong <laughs> in the way that I'm serving someone else. Granted, he does, he does say this, he does add the without grumbling, I believe, because he understands that showing hospitality is sometimes going to be a very hard thing to do. In, in the early church context, showing hospitality oftentimes meant opening up your home to traveling speakers, to traveling preachers, to people who have fallen and they need a few, a few days or some time to get back on their feet and get back to work. And we're to do so. We're to open up our homes and do so without grumbling. Sometimes that's easy to do. But there's a, there's a famous adage that I've heard that, uh, you know, guests or family are like fish. After three days, they just start to stink. And uh, I, think, I think we can all relate with that. You know, we, we've had people that we love very much, but a little bit too much time, and it just starts to get tough. You're, you're stepping on my toes. You're in my way. Your dirty laundry's on my clean floors. Okay, you don't <laughs> do the dishes after you use the plates. Like, what's going on here? And so... It is hard. It is hard at times to, to not grumble. But take that focus off of yourself. And remember the reason why you're showing hospitality in the first place. Remember why you're opening up your home. Jesus is, is coming to you. And he, he has made a way for you. He has shown you life. He has given you new life. He has given you everything. How can we withhold anything from our brothers and sisters? And so we're to show them that love and not worry about them not doing their dishes. I'll wash a million dishes for my brother if, if it means I can show them love. In the same way that Christ showed me love. Verse 10 and part of 11. Okay. As each has received a gift, use it to serve one another as good stewards of God's very grace. Whoever speaks as one who speaks oracles of God, whoever serves as one who serves by the strength that God supplies. First of all, Peter is indicating in the very first section, as each has received a gift, something that Paul has also um, has kind of alluded to in his verses, how each one, each one of us Christians has received a gift, has received something other than <coughs> what we were born with. Whether that's upon conversion, or whether that's a continual gift that he keeps showing to us as we continue our walk with Christ, there seems to be this idea that we each have a specific, a unique gift, and it's for the sake of the church. The, the point isn't when you got it, or what the gift is necessarily. The, sake, the, the purpose there is to serve one another. It's to build the church up. Peter and Paul, in, in Romans 12 and in 1 Corinthians 12, they, they have these list, lists of, of gifts that are from the Holy Spirit. Paul, in, in those two letters, he writes out the, the gift of tongues, the gift of prophecy, the gift of uh, teaching, and he goes on. Whereas Peter just breaks down into these two, two types of gifts. You got your speaking gifts, and you got your serving gifts. He's not, he's not caring necessarily about the specifics of what kind of gifts. He's showing, do it for the sake of building up the church. Do it without grumbling as, who, um, as good stewards of God's very grace. Not everybody is going to get the same gift. Not everybody is going to get the same amount of that gift. If God were to give Ali a shovel and were to give Jared a frying pan, I don't expect Ali to start grumbling and saying, I can't use this shovel. Jared's way stronger than me. Okay, he should use the shovel. <coughs> I, I would expect Ali to start digging 
holes for some reason. <laughs> you know, until she finds out why she's digging holes. She's got the shovel, she's going to start using it. And likewise, Jared, if you've got a frying pan, and you have no idea like what you're going to do with this frying pan, I expect you to start cracking eggs, and maybe throwing some, some vegetables in there, and serving me up a whole bunch of burnt food until you figure out what to do with the gift that you've been given. We're not to complain about the gifts that we have. We're to use them to build one another up. And his point here, to serve one another, to build up the church, is for what reason? The second part of verse 11 says, in order that in everything, God may be glorified through Jesus Christ. In order that in everything, God may be glorified through Jesus Christ. For it's to Him belong the glory and the dominion forever. because of who Jesus is that we even act differently than the world. Because we've seen God. We've seen Jesus. He has revealed himself to us. He has opened our eyes to the truths about him. So our lives look different than the world. It's because of Jesus that we set our minds on an eternity with Jesus on an eternal dwelling place with God the Father. He has secured a spot for us in heaven. Through his blood, through his resurrection. And if you confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. <coughs> and that is no lie. It's because of that that we pray. It's because of that that we love one another and show hospitality. And that we lift one another up and serve one another in our speaking, in our words, in our kindness, in our serving, in our hospitality. The end of all things is at hand. Therefore, the time is now to react to God. There is no time to stop and pick the flower and look over your shoulder and think about what God is going to do with you tomorrow. He's given you the gifts. He's <coughs> given you freedom from the bondage of sin. He's given you <coughs> access to the kingdom of heaven. The end of all things is at hand. The time is now to react to it. I'm going to pray. Dear Jesus, thank you so much for the grace that you have bestowed on us. Thank you for the truths that you have shown to us. pray that we will be doers of the word and not just hearers only. pray that your name will be exalted in our lives so that we will recognize who we are in light of who you are. We are your children, God, and we, we desire to bring you praise for it's to you you belong the glory and the dominion forever and ever.